It's The World This Week, seven days, four Paris space correspondents, one hour, The World This Week, in partnership with The Daily Beast, Daily Beast foreign editor, Christopher Dickey is with us. How are you, sir? Doing good, thanks. All right. It's, it's, a, it's been a very busy week, busy week for Luke Baker, Paris Bureau Chief of the Reuters News Agency. Pretty busy, yeah. But pretty it's busy. Be Just pretty busy. We're averagely busy. Averagely busy. Has it been averagely busy for Vivian Walt, Paris correspondent for Time magazine? Pretty busy, yeah. Pretty busy as well. Gosh, let's try Gil Mahaley, editor-in-chief at uh, the news website Causeur. I was on the beach. You were on the beach the whole time, of course. The World This Week on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag World This Week. So what did happen on Thursday? Iran made a very big mistake, tweeted Donald Trump in the morning after uh, the downing of an unmanned U.S. reconnaissance drone. Uh, by lunchtime, oil prices had skyrocketed. The U.S. president then seemed to ease off. I have a feeling that it was a mistake made by somebody that shouldn't have been doing what they did. I, I find it hard to believe it was intentional, if you want to know the truth. I think that it could have been somebody who was uh, loose and stupid that did it. OK, so we breathed a little easier, but then it was 7 p.m. Washington time, according to The New York Times, when Trump called off U.S. fighter jets that were already in the air. Christopher Dickey, have you been able to piece together what was what happened Thursday? No. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, now Trump is saying that they were never in the air, that he called it off, but it wasn't like they were just 10 minutes away. But then he had tweeted earlier that they were just 10 minutes away. So he's just so in confusion, right, left, right, and center. I mean, uh, I just wrote a piece, we just published a piece, where that you know, basically posed the question, is this madman theory, or is this madman theory being run by an actual madman? Because his policies and actions are so erratic. Mm. Uh, you know, you may want to keep your enemy or your adversary off balance, but He's keeping everyone off balance and in a way that doesn't make any sense. The, the worst thing in terms of madman theory is you want Iran to believe you're capable of doing anything, fire and fury, doing, you know, raining thunder down upon them. But it's now clear that the policy is just going to be proportional response. Well, but he, so. here's, okay, here's the su first surprise. I mean, this was a very fast leak. Uh, the, uh, the, they wanted it, it to was, be known. They say, yeah. no, New York Times said it was 7 p.m. Washington time. They wanted it to be but, known. Yeah, and the New York Times article, in fact, said it seemed as if they wanted it to be known. Right, they said no, no administration official asked us not to publish yeah, this information. Yeah, there was no pushback. Right. Mm -hmm. right. So it's kind of, what's the strategy there? Well, I mean, I guess another form of saber rattling in some in some way to show how close this thing has has got. You know, the planes were almost in the air. Um, ships were sort of positioned for some, you know, in some offensive, you know, way to kind of threaten Iran. At the same time, we've been reporting today from uh, we've heard from Iranian officials that there was an, a message sent via Oman, uh, Oman, to uh, the Iranians saying that uh, Trump didn't really want to. <laughs> launch a war. He wants to talk. Um, and the Iranians um, uh, sent the message back, look, uh, it's only, there's only one decider here, the Ayatollah. He doesn't really want to talk Yeah, right he now. gave us, you, your report says, he gave us a short period of time to get our response, but Iran's immediate response was it's up to the supreme leader to decide about this issue. Right. So I think from what we understand, the message went back saying, well, he, he's not ready to talk. He doesn't want to talk. You've got to uh, lift the sanctions if he's going to talk. Um, but still, you know, this this Supposed foreign media, attack. by the way, in Tehran told not to report on this. Right. I mean, what does well, that tell you? I, I, you know, I think Tehran is probably at this point very, very confused. At one level, I think they're being a relatively rational actor. We have this dispute over where exactly the drone was when it was shot down. Uh, Iran has often played a very cautious game with this, but I think with the Brits about sort of 10 years ago now, they had an incident in one of the straits where they, they also seized some uh, British sailors, and it was turned out that actually those sailors had crossed into Iranian territory. We don't know where this drone was, but they're generally pretty logical actors well, in this. The worst incident was Iran Air 655. The USS Vincennes shot an Iranian Airbus out of the sky, killed uh, almost 300 people, 66 of them children, and it was, in fact, in Iranian territorial waters. So either the Americans just can't figure out where, and Brits can't figure out where Iranian territorial waters are, or we need to look at this really closely before we take the um, administration's word about it. Gil Mahaley, this uh, sending sh uh, planes to strike and then 
uh, aborting the mission or publicizing that you're aborting the mission, does that make the U.S. seem weak or strong in the eyes of Iran? I think by nature and by temperament, um, Trump is a poker player where you need to, to you need a check play, uh, chess players. And the problem when you are transforming this crisis into a poker game is that the United States has a very, has a very, uh, very weak hand because everyone knows that it won't go to war. There is no, there is no uh, revolver on the table, and the Iranians know it. When Israel was in, in a certain way in, 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 um, in conflict with, uh, with um, Iran, uh, probably Netanyahu and Barak, the prime, prime minister and the defense minister, defense minister lied to the head of the Mossad and to the head and to the chief of staff of the army. So they will act as if you're going to war. You need, in order, that, in order to make the Iranian believe that you will strike, you need to go a long way. So the United States has a very, has a very weak hand in, in poker. Uh, however, if it was a chess game, uh, the, the sanctions are doing harm in, in, in Iran. Uh, Iran is not in a bad shape, in a good shape in, 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 uh, in Syria. And China doesn't want uh, trouble. So, so if the game was more complicated, more sophisticated, there would be things to do. Well, when you, you turn it into a, a, a Western poker play, a game, it's, it's badly run, and it, I, I, don't, I don't understand where he wants things to go. So the question everyone's asking, Vivian Walt, is could it spin out of control? Well, I was just about to say that. It's just, uh, um, I think what Gil says is right, except that it leaves out the possibility of unintended consequences. And this seems to be one scenario where this could well spin out of control. You have um, Israel, for example, who might strike itself. And um, and you have the fact that there's the Strait of Hormuz, where tankers are, in fact, getting um, targeted. And there's one third of the world's you know, seaborne oil going through it. So I think that there's so many different factors that could, that do have the potential for um, leading somewhere where Trump um, is not near to even considering the effects of. Yeah, the, U the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration uh, issuing an emergency order prohibiting U.S. air carriers from flying in Iran-controlled airspace over the Strait of Hormuz and the Gulf of Oman. Major European carriers like Lufthansa and British Airways are also avoiding uh, the area, Christopher Dickey. You mentioned that I Iran air, 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 air that was a uh, plane yeah. that was uh, shot mm -hmm. that was shot down. You, you, you on Twitter posted uh, the article you wrote for Newsweek about it in 1988. Yeah, when I went to see the bodies in the morgue and then went to the funeral of about 70 of the people who were mm -hmm. killed. And... Uh, yeah, it was a horrible event, and it was one that could have easily been avoided. It was a commercial flight on a regular route, uh, flying at a regular time. Uh, but the captain of the Vincennes had engaged a bunch of small uh, Iranian patrol boats and was fighting with them. And they see a plane go overhead, and they just shot it out of the sky. In 2019, again, picking up on what Vivian says, could we see Sure, some? sure. That kind of thing could happen again. It could happen on the Iranian side. It could happen on the American side. Mm -hmm. You know, this is many ways is a replay of what happened uh, in 1987 and 1988 when the U.S. intervened in the tanker war on the side of Saddam Hussein, as a matter of fact, uh, to put pressure on Iran. Uh, and, uh, and it led into uh, a terrible situation where mm -hmm. ultimately the climax of that was the murder of all those people on Iran Air 655. And, and, and a possible link with the Lockerbie bombing. Which right, happened exactly. Right the Pan Am... Um, Pan Am 103. 103. 103. 103, exactly. The Pan Am 103, which was supposedly the retaliation for... Well, except that it was done by the Libyans. So right. right. A little more. Well, I think it was outsourced is still a matter of debate. But you've got that, you've got an unpredictable actor sitting in the White House who, even in the last 24 hours, has sent several different messages, one very threatening, another potentially conciliatory, a third deciding not to apparently carry out an attack. But you've also got a couple of proxies in this battle here. You've got the Saudis, who very much obviously have been waging a campaign for a number of years against the 
feeling threatened by the Iranians or trying to build a coalition against the Iranians. You've got the Qataris who are caught in the middle, and there's a lot of tension clearly between uh, Qatar and the Saudis and their and their uh, uh, allies at this point. So I think you've got the risk in other in other ways. This spills out in other ways, well, not just. In, in any situation like this, you watch for the atrocity. You watch for deaths of people or the threatened death of people. Mm -hmm. uh, when that happens, then you see an intervention uh, and a major intervention. Sometimes you have a situation, for instance, with Libya uh, in the 80s, where they're pressured and pushed very much the way Iran is being pressured and pushed. Finally, there's a terrorist action in Berlin Mm. where some servicemen are killed, and the next thing you know, we're bombing the hell out of Tri Tripoli and Benghazi and trying to kill Gaddafi mm -hmm. with those bombs. Uh, more recently, you know, you had, you had a, an effort to get Saddam Hussein to do that in 2002 and 2003, but he was too smart to do it, so we had to invade Iran, uh, Iraq on the, with the fiction of what, weapons of mass destruction. But in, in 2011, I won't keep going on about this, but again with Libya, you know, you could see everything was, in, was ready to intervene in Libya, but everybody needed an excuse to do it. And nobody was killed yet uh, on, on the American or European side, but when Gaddafi said he was going to kill everybody in Benghazi, that was it. Yeah. Gil Mahaley, we've, this is all completely overshadowing this diplomatic effort that was launched this week by France, Germany, and the UK to talk with Iran because there's that 10-day ultimatum they've given for effectively stopping cooperation with the 2015 nuclear deal, and it's an ultimatum directed at Europe. Well, as I said, it's a very complicated game. And I think that the uh, Iranians decided that they, what they are doing is kind of a brakemanship. Um, and they get nearer to the threshold. They try to see how far they can go um, on the uh, tankers American front. Uh, since the United States have, States has very little credibility, they can go very far without saying we did it. And, and, and so keep it under the uh, reaction threshold. And with the nuclear uh, channel, they're doing the same thing. They are doing, um, they are announcing things and they are doing things, but I still feel that they want, uh, th that it's a message more than a changing of strategy. I, I mean, uh, my, my question is, okay, Trump wants to force Iran to back down. Um, Iran, however, has its back against the wall in some, in many senses, economically completely now. Um, so I am very confused about what the strategy is. What are they actually going to force Iran to do? Um, you know, they've, uh, it, would, it would seem that they needed to have, re like, gone back a couple of steps in order to do that. The jackpot, well, I think, is regime, regime change. They are hoping to create a situation for regime change. And then, and and then what? Exactly. Yeah. What? And, 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 you know, I found, I f I found a, a tweet uh, by Trump, uh, September 9th, 2013. It's always a tweet. Yes, <laughs> but he wasn't a candidate at the time. Uh, and he said to Obama, who was considering uh, attacking uh, Syria after the chemical attacks, hold your fire mm. and save your powder for a, for a better day. Yeah. <laughs> It's amazing. No. That's exactly what he, he's playing. He's playing both parts. Well, well, he's running on one side, and he's a warmonger. Then he's going to well, the other before, side. Say, before he was on Twitter in 1987, during the other other deployment, he put he bought he spent more than ninety thousand dollars to buy full page ads in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Boston Globe to say that America was laughing was the laughing stock of the world, that we were being completely humiliated because we were protecting ships that we didn't own, carrying oil that, didn't, that we didn't need uh, to allies who wouldn't help us, mm. which sounds actually like what's happening now. I think we're in a, the crazy situation is, and I think we ended up with someone from the State Department saying, you know, Iran needs to adhere to this nuclear deal even though the United States has withdrawn from it. We've got, it's, we, it's almost like we're chasing one another's tails. Mm. I think ultimately, we're in a situation where 
Well, I think what needs to happen clearly is someone needs to find a method for helping everyone to climb down from the tree. And that's where, the, the, and you need logical actors for that. And that's the most difficult thing because Trump is, is tacking um, one way and the other, ducking and weaving. And I'm not sure whether he really wants to maintain the threat. And I think he's just be, let the air out of the balloon. But at the same time, he doesn't want to appear weak. And and now is the risk, you know, how does he climb down and actually come out looking strong? And I don't know how he does it. With, with North Korea, mm -hmm. one day the guy is rocket man. And the other day, the other day, he's his best friend mm -hmm. in the oh, world. They're in love. In and, love. Building, and, 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 so, and yet the nuclear threat. So, yeah, so things, yeah, exactly, without getting anything in return. It's, right. it's not such a great deal. <laughs> Look, I mean, we're dealing with a man who just wants to make deals that Obama didn't make. And the irony is the best deal he's likely to get is exactly the deal that Obama right. got. It's very much like the NAFTA negotiations. If he ever gets the Iranians to the table, what he'll walk away with will be pretty much exactly what existed like before Mexico. all these crises, like Mexico. But the problem is that the Iranians at this point are saying, that's not enough. Mm. You can't jerk us around this way anymore. If we go to the table, you're going to have to actually lift sanctions, not just deliver waivers, right. not just give us relief from sanctions. I mean, end them. Gil, we're you, not going to do that. The U.S. isn't going to. You said it's a game of chess. Well, the Iranians invented chess, right? I, mean, well, I think course. they're several steps ahead here. Right? <laughs> they also invented poker, as a matter of fact. <laughs> Did they? Oh, <laughs> yes, they really. <laughs> All right. Uh, the, there was uh, Donald Trump's rally Tuesday in Florida, where the U.S. president formally launched his 2020 uh, re-election bid. And there, he said, told the base effectively, no more wars, that uh, he was against mm -hmm. uh, go going to war. Uh, we're going to see his national security advisor in Israel this weekend, John Bolton, who's very hawkish and who's going to be meeting with his Israeli and Russian counterparts. Uh, again, it's a question of who has the U.S. president's ear and a question of what Europe is going to do about it. Well, what's interesting about the Iranian situation is that Europe, you know, unlike the campaign against ISIS, for example, here's a battle that Europe is really not behind Trump on. And um, yet they have to abide by what he does. Essentially, they have to. Of course, they have to. Yes, there's no way that they can continue you know, trading with Iran, if there's going to be the risk of being sanctioned in the U.S., there's no way that's going to happen. And therefore, um, this is one instance in, when, in which the U.S. Trump can lay down the law and Europe has to follow. Effectively. Well, I think, yeah, unfortunately, Europe has painted itself into a bit of a corner because it wants to believe that, you know, the best way of curtail curtailing Iran's ambitions is to have the deal. Um, it wants to show uh, willing and in, um, sort of creativity, if you like, in sort of trying to find ways to continue to allow uh, Iran to trade by creating a mechanism that is put together through a great deal of blood, sweat and sort of creativity and, and in the hope of somehow avoiding sanctions by creating an alternative means of, uh, of payment. And yet the Iranians are still blaming them for not really stepping up, right? And because they're, they're not delivering anything. Well, they, it's there. You know, show me it's this there, mechanism. Show me the me I can't eat the mechanism, you know? It's, but, I mean. well, but it's there. But also it depends on the confidence of basically medium-sized companies that will always threat, uh, feel the threat that if they do one little bit of business mm -hmm. with the United States or they have one account in the United States or they get hold of anything. Well, they, they, they say the through. mail through Gmail. It could be that, right? But, well, but this is the important thing about Trump. He thinks the dollar is his most potent weapon. And, it, and nobody has ever used it as aggressively as he does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he'd like to keep it that way. All right. Yeah. An unpredictable U.S. president. Well, we have an unpredictable U.K. prime minister soon. <laughs> Stay with us. You're watching The World This Week. Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's The World This Week. The World This Week in partnership with The Daily Beast Daily Beast foreign editor Christopher Dickey is with us, as is uh, Luke Baker, Paris Bureau Chief of the Reuters News Agency, Vivian Walt, Paris correspondent for Time magazine, and Gil Mahaley, editor-in-chief of uh, the uh, website Causeur, Causeur.fr, .fr indeed. Uh, Donald Trump, we were talking about him in part one, his re-election, he formally announced this week, a long way from certain. It's uh, safer to bet on who the next Tory leader will be. The total number of votes given to each candidate were as follows. Michael Gove, 75. Jeremy Hunt, 77. Boris Johnson, 160. 
Do you hear those oohs, Luke Baker? Well, I mean, the reason being, right? Well, A, it was only two seats, and it switched uh, direction, because I think in the earlier round, Gove was, was one, one or two seats ahead of Hunt. But it, this goes back to kind of... Oxford Union at Oxford, where they all were sort of studying um, more or less contemporaneously, that sort of political dealing where allegedly um, Boris Johnson may have sh given some of his votes over to Hunt's team to ensure that he was going to emerge as his challenger for the runoff, rather than Michael Gove, who, who stabbed him in the back at the last attempt to run uh, the Conservative Party. A, a reminder that House of Cards was originally a Basically UK Basically a UK. <laughs> <laughs> and it never goes away. Right. And that people continue to behave in this, yeah, backhanded kind of way. Now, there's no evidence of that, but it seems pretty likely that something like that happened. So here we have it. Prime Minister Johnson, can you say it? <laughs> well, <laughs> hi, Prime Minister Bojo. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it... it Talking about House of Cards, I mean, it is all, there's always a kind of soap operatic element to the whole Brexit story, and yet it affects the rest of Europe, and it could not be more serious. It's not just about the Conservative Party and who becomes the Prime Minister of Britain, which is neither here nor there. It's really about what happens to another 27 countries, and, uh, and I, I don't think it's going to be too good. By the looks of it. Well, what's really crazy is that we're now, you know, towards the back end of June, they're going to be a month long campaign now between right. Jeremy Hunt and Boris Johnson for the leadership. It's pretty clear already that Boris Johnson's going to get it. Do you really think they're going to talk? They're not going to come up with any new ideas on how to carry out or make Brexit happen with a deal between now and, and when that month's up. Then and, there's August, so that's summer vacation. August, right? summer vacation, and you're already backed up against the October 31st deadline, and right. it's clear on the other side that Europe is not going to budge. Right. My heart goes to the, to the Queen, you know. The <laughs> Boris on the one side and Archie on the other side. <laughs> It's uh, that, that October 31st deadline looms large. And after Theresa May's mantra of Brexit means Brexit, Brexit, Bojo promising rank and file inside the Conservative Party uh, the day he launched his candidacy, that he will deliver on that October 31st deadline. I will do absolutely anything I can within the bounds of the Constitution and the law to prevent the government of the UK from passing into the hands of those who, by their total disdain for wealth creation, their contempt for the normal aspirations of millions to improve their lives, would compromise our ability to fund the NHS and so much else besides. My friends, we cannot let them anywhere near Downing Street. Standing up for the little guy. No, he's not. He's not doing that at all. He's saying we can't let Jeremy Corbyn, the head of the Labour Party, near Downing mm -hmm. Street. Right. That's what he's saying. They're terrified. First of all, let's remember, this is a sham of a, dip of a, a, a democratic process. We're not talking about the British people right. electing their new prime minister. We're talking about 120,000 Tories. 160. Whatever. <laughs> Out of 48 million voters electing their leader to be the prime minister for the, at this crucial to period. To which the Tories would reply that Gordon Brown replaced uh, Tony Blair without an election. Well, did that strike anybody as particularly Thatcher, democratic? When Thatcher stepped down, it was uh, 200 Look, or 300. Point, well, I, I agree. It's a lousy system. It was a lousy yeah. system then. It's a lousy system now. But in those transitions, you didn't have the crisis that you have now. Mm -hmm. A, two, a huge existential crisis. And for the Tories to be acting like they have a complete grip on the government and don't have to listen to anybody else is pretty amazing. But the thing that really scares the hell out of them is that if they were to go to general election, their party is so unpopular and so weak and so undemocratic that Jeremy Corbyn could wind up as the next prime minister, and that's what Boris Johnson was talking about. Let's, let's talk about those 160,000 members who will be electing the next Conservative Party leader, uh, winning over the Tories, ruling the nation, two distinct challenges. Tory voters who don't seem uh, that bothered about the survival of their own party, at least according to a YouGov poll, more than half would prefer to see the Conservative Party destroyed that's 54% on that chart. Uh, if it meant delivering on Brexit, 63% uh, 
wouldn't mind too much if Scotland left, if it meant delivering on Brexit. 59% of party members would be willing to uh, let go of Northern Ireland uh, if it meant delivering on uh, Brexit. And yes, Christopher is right. The one uh, ch chart, if we call it up one, one more time there, the one that does scare them is, is the one uh, where there is a minority, is if Brexit was delivered with Jeremy Corbyn as prime minister, then they'd be against it. It's, I mean, look, we're talking as... as, how, can, as Chris, how can a party member not be that bothered about the destruction of their own party, Luke? Well, I think, that, I think the point is that they, as I think, some, again, to take the view that I, I heard someone trying to explain this graph, someone from the Conservative Party saying, it's not, we don't think many of these things are likely. And so, it, you know, we want Brexit to happen. We don't think Scotland breaking away is likely. So, of course, we worry less about Scotland breaking away than we do about carrying out Brexit. The one thing that is... Likely That's impossible. That's not how I read that. that, that well, no, I mean, I, again, but uh, yeah, I read spending. it as kind of them being so obsessed with Brexit that anything else just doesn't matter, even if it ends up, you know, breaking apart the union. Gil, Gil Mahaley, Brexit has become more important than allegiance to a political party to which you're a paid up dues member. Because uh, maybe like in France or other places, there was a tectonic shift and parties are following. And um, Bre Brexit is England against London, is uh, those who are losing from the current system against those who are winning from the current system. The same kind of anger we find uh, among people who voted for Trump in the United States or are voting for uh, radical right or populist parties in, 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 uh, in Western Europe. So I guess this, this, is, this, is, uh, this is the real question. People are really unhappy about the deal uh, they see that uh, th their situation is bad and it's going to be worse for the children. I think this is the this is the, the this is the issue. V Vivian, there's one more surprise in this survey, by the way. Nearly half of the 892 polled by YouGov would be fine with Nigel Farage being the next leader of the Conservatives. Nigel Farage, who's not a member, by the way, well, of the Conservative Party. Well, you know, they did party. just win the EU elections in Britain. Um, and so one has to really wonder, and, and I think Gil's quite right, um, maybe the Conservative Party has run its course, in fact, and maybe all these parties have. I do recall, like, a couple of years ago, taking a road trip from Edinburgh to London, and it was, was so striking to me, and it's not a country that I know all that well, um, is that it really is two Englands. And there is, it's just remarkable when you drive into London, you are, in a sense, driving into a different country. And I think this is playing out in this incredible bitterness. Uh and going to back to what Christopher said, there, there are 160,000 members of the Conservative Party. I think the average age is north of 67 years old or something. They're all well, easy they're, on that, OK. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's not for nothing that they were once referred to, even by somebody in the Conservative Party, by somebody um, close to David Cameron, as the swivel-eyed loons. What he meant by that was <laughs> these are people who are... You know, I'm not saying I'm not casting all of them like that, but that was the description. Very someone Oxford in, thing to say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but they, they're qu there's quite a reactionary core. They're ex deeply conservative, deeply uh, um, committed now to this concept of Brexit, no matter what happens. Put, put the age aside. There's something deeper here, perhaps. It's the end of political parties as we mm. know them. Well, end of the political parties that we know, yes. But there, there will be new parties that emerge. I mean, Already. you know, you, uh, we saw it here in France. I mean, uh, En Marche has absolutely destroyed most of the traditional political parties. But eventually, En Marche will be just another one of the political parties yeah. of France. I mean, I think that I think the long-term course is like that in Britain, but the difficulty we face is a very different political uh, structure and a first-past-the-post system and, a, and an indentured kind of existence of these parties that I think breaking them down over time is much harder than... I mean, I think it, people were even astonished at how quickly Macron was able to do it, mm -hmm. right? And I, don't, I think it'll take longer in Britain. All right, Vivian Walt, uh, your piece in this week's Time magazine exposes the rise of anti-Semitism. And you write, yet for all the grim statistics, there are signs of hope across Europe. Uh, as anti-Semitism has risen, the fight against it has intensified both among regular Europeans and their politicians. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I, I did quite a lot of traveling around Europe looking at this question. And I myself, you know, uh, do not claim to have come to much definitive conclusion on this question. My question was, 
is Europe really anti-Semitic, as many Americans would say it, it is? Um, and uh, I'm not sure about the answer. What I did find, however, is that everywhere you look, there are new projects and initiatives um, starting up or in now, you know, in full-fledged running um, of, uh, you know, Muslims and Jews getting together, um, having prayer services together, um, having, you know, basketball matches together, things that you would think of as being quite trivial, but in fact are having quite a big impact on a number of communities all over the place. And what was the what was the trigger point? Was it 2015 and the, the, the terror attacks here in 2015 Paris? changed a lot of things. And um, if you might remember, it also coincided with the attack on the synagogue in Copenhagen and, and a whole variety of things, actually. Um, and... Uh, and then came the enormous migrant influx, and the majority of them are Muslim, and the majority of which come from countries with very complicated relationships with Israel, and by extension, for many people, Jewish people. So um, a whole lot of factors combined to um, create a very intense moment in time in terms of anti-Semitism. Gil Mahaley, do you feel as though there's blowback against the, the rising anti-Semitism in Europe? <clears throat> I do see, see those initiatives and law initiatives and other actions, but I think that uh, it's, it's quite a, an important wave that is rising because, <clears throat> first of all, it's part of a larger phenomena of conspiracy theories. I mean, mm. one of the most popular and the oldest conspiracy, conspiracy theories is the Jews uh, control the world, and they are behind almost everything. And because uh, more and more people, maybe through social networks and internet, are into this, uh, by uh, almost a mechanical effect, you have more and more people who discover themselves as anti-Semites. This is one thing. The other thing is that, amazingly enough, um, revisionism and negationism of the of the Holocaust mm. is getting more and more mm. popular, yeah. uh, in a way. Probably. And and of course, there's <clears throat> the, the the problem with Israel and with anti-Zionism, which is a, as such legitimate, but almost in all these concrete appearances, is only the mask for uh, anti-Semitism. So we are facing something which is old, but also very new, and which is adapted. It's like a virus that mm. muted mm. and adapted itself to, to the 20th, 20th, 21st century in, in a remarkable way. We've seen all these initiatives by the French president um, against um, hate speech. Uh, there, there's the laws that have come up. There was that summit, not just, by the way, against anti-Semitism. We saw that that summit that where he was stood side by side with the New Zealand prime minister. Mm. Is it, I mean, is there, is, do you feel the blowback against, uh, against the, the echo chambers? Well, that, that I, spawn I think, hate? I, I think for sure it exists. There's a lot of it as, uh, as Viv says, but I don't think it's very effective because I don't think it's nearly as effective as what mm. goes out on the internet, the conspiracy theories, all these, all these ideas that play to, uh, either deep-seated prejudices or newly acquired prejudices. I think it's also a very different kind of surge in anti-Semitism than we saw some years ago, where it was almost always tied to conflicts in the Middle East. Mm. There'd, be, exactly. there'd be an invasion of Lebanon or there'd be uh, <clears throat> the Intifada, and you would have uh, Muslim, uh, Muslims, particularly Muslim kids, acting out in the banlieue, uh, in the suburbs. And that was all very ugly, but it was a different kind of environment. Now the white identitarian mm. part of it is much bigger than it used to used and to be, and that is really scary. And the white identita identitarians are as happy hating Jews as they are hating Muslims. Mm. And it's actually, one one element of the story of my reporting that did not um, ultimately make it into the magazine for various reasons was um, interviews with some of the neo-Nazis. Mm. Um, who are completely open about their their plan, their program, vision of um, basically expelling most of the Jews from from Europe, mm. um, 
And uh, th that was somewhat shocking to me. And even as, you know, Facebook is talking about shutting down hate, hate sites, etc., cetera, um, they, they're launching podcasts in, Engle in English. Um, they're connecting with other yeah, yeah. neo-Nazi mm. groups around the world. And, and this we've is... Seen, a, we've seen, yeah. we've seen examples of how, how that's gone global. Earlier, we had a, a Newsweek flashback. So for the sake of parody, we're going to show you a cover of Time magazine, 2012. <laughs> And it was the picture of uh, Egypt's first and only mm. democratically elected civilian president. The caption, the most important man in the Middle East, Mohamed Morsi, who spent That's most of the last six years, uh, Luke Baker, in solitary mm. uh, confinement, collapsed on Monday at his trial mm. and died at the age of 67. With also very little sort of not w not with a bang but with a whimper right i mean there was very little sort of mm. commentary in the world there was very i don't i didn't i don't think i even saw a statement issued by 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 the elise maybe wrong or by other um heads of state this is someone who uh was democratically elected uh, to the most populous nation uh, in, in the middle east and um you know clearly uh has spent as you said the last six years effectively in solitary confinement and prison and then died at the head of a movement that's still very much there, still forced underground, still very extant in other countries in the region. And it is kind of remarkable to me that, it, that, that there's been this ability to kind of so absolutely suppress what Morsi tried to stand for, rightly or wrongly. Um, and I wonder what that means for, for the movement and his supporters in Egypt. Um, e Egypt's uh, authorities who uh, criticized a human rights commission call for an international inquiry into prison conditions in the wake uh, of this death as the politicization of a death of natural causes, Christopher Dickey? Well, maybe it was a death of natural causes. Uh, I, you know, I don't think he was poisoned. I don't think he was assassinated. They could have His done family that. claimed that he hadn't had, uh, uh, he didn't have a, enough of his medication, that he needed insulin. Maybe, maybe. I mean, the, the Egyptian jails are brutal, and the uh, Egyptian regime of Abdel Fattah al-Sisi is a brutal regime. On the other hand, uh, it looked like before he was deposed, Sisi's regime was going to be pretty brutal as well. Morsi's. Uh, Morsi's. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. Morsi's uh, regime was going to be pretty uh, brutal as well. You know, I, I was just thinking about what you were saying, Luke, about not, it not raising the kind of furor that you would expect. I think even the, the Ikhwan, the Muslim Brotherhood, must have felt that Morsi blew it. Mm. He just blew it. They had the biggest chance they'd ever had to rule, in fact, the most populous country in the Arab world, and they completely screwed up and lost it. You know, the symbol is that he, he promoted uh, Sisi. Yeah, well, no, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. talk yeah. about screwing up, yeah. right? <laughs> of course, now it's Friday, and Egypt's focus uh, is not on Mohamed Morsi, but on Mo. Mo being Mohamed Salah, the undisputed star of the African Nations Cup football tournament that uh, kicks off on home soil for the Pharaohs and for the continent's player of the year. The Liverpool striker hopes uh, to lead Egypt to the title. And uh, it's, it's strange because it's like parallel universes, isn't it? Oh, that's oh let's true. forget about politics. Let's talk about football. Actually, I, I was just in New York a couple of weeks ago, and uh, there were like signs everywhere the King of Egypt, um, <laughs> Mo Salah. So he is most certainly the mo you know, he's far and away more famous than uh, Morsi is, for example, of Sisi, and uh, extraordinarily popular. What kind of an African Nations Cup is it going to be? under the circumstances of uh, this crackdown and such? Well, I, I, don't, I don't know. It's quite difficult to say. I mean, I've covered a couple of them, but it was ages and ages ago. I mean, I always feel that the, the African Nations Cup or African Cup of Nations, whatever they call it, fails to kind of max, really sort of build the momentum that it, that it wants to. Uh, it's, been a sort of a, it's been a competition that is very well followed in Africa, quite well followed around the world, but not really intensely like a World Cup, clearly. And it never really built on that success in the past. Whereas you take, by comparison, the Women's World Cup now, which in France is finding this enormous momentum, I think, and actually taking the sport to a higher level. The African Nations Cup is, um, is one of those competitions where, I don't know what people think about football, but there, there, there are some games that are very competitive and other games that are really pretty terrible. And, and, and I wonder whether in the circumstances, as we were discussing earlier, whether you've got games in Egypt taking place in places where you want to get big crowds in Port Said, I'm not sure how that's necessarily going to go down. I mean, 
I hope it's going to be a big success, but I, I, I struggle to see it. All right. Reaching it. We'll leave it there. Luke Baker, I want to thank you. I want to thank Gil Mahaley, Christopher Dickey, Vivian Waltz. Stay with us. Media Watch is next.